Kentucky basketball picked up a nice victory over New Mexico State to open the season. And let me tell you, the Wildcats got out and ran in this contest. You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what is going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. So in today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be recapping the Kentucky Wildcats' 86-46 season-opening victory over New Mexico State. Going to talk about the good things that happened in this contest, the bad things, and we're going to look ahead to what's next. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business, and that's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. You can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. Like I mentioned, 86-46 to was the final score in this one. It was a close game at half, but the Wildcats ended up running away with this one, and run away they did. That's the first thing I want to talk about here, talking about the positives from this victory, the pacing in this game. I'm curious to see where this falls on Kim Palm and how the Wildcats grade out here once they start to accumulate more data But they ran up and down the court, and their adjusted tempo is probably going to be somewhere in the top 20, maybe even top 15. I mean, just about every other time Kentucky got a missed shot or uh, New Mexico State scored, they took the ball out or they, they got the rebound, and then they just immediately shot it up the court, whether it be... It it was literally a number of players, whether it be Justin Edwards throwing the ball across the court to get somebody in the corner to see if they can make something happen driving down the baseline. It was Rob Dillingham trying to go coast to coast or DJ Wagner being aggressive, getting into the paint, kicking it back out for a three. So many different interesting things that this offense tried to do in this season opener against New Mexico State, and it all had to do with the pacing. I feel like at times there were moments where Kentucky was a little bit out of sync with how fast that they were running, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think that's just something they're going to have to get more comfortable with and mold into, but this team looks like a team that has played a good bit with each other despite all of them being freshmen and despite the fact that they really haven't had a whole whole lot of time to gel. Obviously, most of them got to play in the Global Jam, then they got to play in the two exhibition games. They're ready to go ahead and get things going here. A lot of really good things to take away from this one offensively, and then on top of that, it's just the pace kind of dictated most of those really, really good things. I was impressed with the way that Kentucky sped things up, and the broadcast was trying to paint this picture as well, if you were watching this on SEC Network, about how this is maybe a new era of Kentucky basketball with the way that they're shooting their shots, the way they're selecting their shots, the way that they're playing with pace, the personnel that they have. It's going to be an interesting year. And getting those three seven-footers back uh, in Aaron Bradshaw, you've got on Yenzo and Zvonimir Ivasic, is going to be really interesting to see how they affect the pacing and the speed in this lineup. Again, very impressive, a lot of fun. Curious to see where Kentucky, uh, Kentucky takes it. Like I mentioned, one of the players that was really uh, aggressive in transition, Rob Dillingham, had himself a night. He had a really good game. 17 points was a a, uh, a game high. 6 of 11 shooting. He was 2 of 6 from outside the arc. He made all of his free throws. He had 5 rebounds. He had 3 assists. He also had a couple of steals. 0 turnovers for Rob Dillingham. And then a plus, plus 24 plus minus. He did some really good things out there for the Wildcats on the offensive end of the floor. Uh, Again, there are multiple Wildcats on this team. We're going to talk about a couple of them here in just a second that have phenomenal vision when it comes to seeing things unfold as plays are developing, as the, uh, the, the fast break offense, as the transition is happening. And they're really, really good at seeing those things happen passing people open sometimes it almost feels like Rob Dillingham is right there at the forefront of that he is an incredibly fun player to watch he made a couple of really tough threes uh in this one uh the two that he took were were some tough buckets I thought 
I was impressed. Overall, I was really impressed with Rob Dillingham at the point guard spot. And then you go to the starting point guard, and I need to go ahead and pause for water because I'm just so excited about how this uh, how this uh, in, in ended up here for, for UK. The starting point guard, DJ Wagner, we're going to talk about his outside shooting in a little bit. But the 6 of 13 from the floor to have 13 points, two rebounds, four assists, only one turnover, have three steals on top of that in 27 minutes. If you can get a little bit better of an outside shot going, that's a phenomenal uh, performance from your one and your two uh, at the point guard spots. I think that there is a big concern about Antonio Reeves and whether or not he is able to carry the load for Kentucky at times this season. And I, I do think that Wagner and Dillingham, with their form and their selection, they're not going to, to, to statistically be the best three-point shooters uh, on this team. I, I don't think that there are a lot of like really, really, really good three-point shooters on this team. We may be talking about one here in just a second. But Wagner... I think with his shots and what he does outside of that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm I'm choking right now. Uh, what Wagner does outside of that was really impressive, really impressive. The effort and the heart and the way that he fought on the court. The broadcast continued to point it out about how every single time somebody tried to set a screen on Wagner, he just fight through it. He just fight through the ball, uh, the uh, the uh, the ball screen, and um, he he was doing things like that. He was diving for loose balls. He was being aggressive. Uh, on the defensive end as a whole, he was grabbing rebounds. Uh, there was a lot of heart and effort that was shown from a group of mostly 18 and 19-year-old kids. And to have somebody like Wagner in your backcourt to be able to kind of lead, and whenever his outside shot's not going to continue to work as hard as he did on the defensive end of the floor, that is very refreshing to see. And I hope, my hope here is that for this entire team, that mentality that state of mind does not change after you lose a game. Even throughout the lo- uh, the process of a loss, which Kentucky is going to have some at this uh, this season, they're going to have losses. Having that mentality and then sticking with it, I think it's going to be really important uh, for, for these young kids because it could end up being a little bit of a roller coaster at times. And I'm not saying Kentucky's going to lose. I'm just saying you're going to have to fight through a lot of adversity against some really good opponents. And showing this out of the gate is really, really refreshing to see. It shows a lot of maturity, I, I think, um, from, mo- from, from, from all these players at different points in this game. And then the third thing I want to get to here is Reed Shepard, the guards, man. The guards looked really good in this game. Uh, Antonio Reeves didn't have a great day shooting 4 of 10 overall, um, but I think the, the, uh, the quartet there of Shepard, Wagner, Rob, and, uh, and Reed... Um, all played very well. All of them scored in double figures. Reed Shepard's 12 points on four of six shooting. He had two steals, two blocks, two assists, five rebounds, uh, made one of two threes, made all of his free throws uh, in just 21 minutes of action. And I don't think Reed Shepard is going to be um, that, as as efficient, I think, night in and night out. But man, you're going to see this about every other night, I think, from Reed Shepard. You're going to see him dominate I think statistically on the defensive end at times you're going to end up seeing him finish games with four or five steals uh, on occasion you're going to see box scores like this where he just fills it up and he is able to do a lot of different things for this squad it goes back to what Cal said I believe back in like June or July about how Reed Shepard just because he's the lone four star in this group and the other guys are all five stars he came here for a reason. He's a great contributor, and he came to make this team better, and he came here to win, and he is absolutely doing that right now through the exhibition games and now through the first game against New Mexico State. Props to the guards, man. They played really good in this one, and Kentucky's going to need them to continue to play well if they are going to have a chance against Kansas here in just a couple of games. So I want to continue along with the good and the bad here and then get to kind of our assessment overall of this team after the first game. Before I get to that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at Athletic Brewing. It's time for the Game Changer of the Week, brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. Much like players like Reed Shepard, who do a lot of different things for Kentucky basketball, Athletic Brewing has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste really, really good. Like I mentioned, Reed Shepard, statistically doing a lot of different things for the Wildcats 
both in their exhibition games and now here at the start of the season. He's going to continue to be a game changer for not just this offense, but also the defense uh, on Kentucky's team. They're going to need players like him to step up, uh, step up off the bench, and he looked phenomenal in game one. Athletic Brewing, like I said, makes non-alcoholic beers that actually taste really good, and they are full of flavor. They're well-crafted, just like a full-strength beer, and they brew over 50 styles of craft non-alcoholic beer, including IPAs, Goldens, Sours, and more. They're the fastest and growing non-alcoholic brewery in the U.S., so you need to get on board. You can find them at Athletic Brewing Company, or excuse me, athleticbrewing.com, or you can find their non-alcoholic brews at a store near you. First-time customers can use code Locked On to get 15% off their first online order. That's code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com near beer, exclusions, and conditions apply. All right, continuing along here on the Monday edition of Locked On Kentucky. Lance Dahl, hanging out here with you. Really appreciate you making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. I want to remind you guys, if you have not subscribed to the show already, please go ahead and do so. Really excited to get this season underway with you guys, getting to recap this first uh, first game here for UK. Whether you're watching on YouTube or on podcast, doesn't matter. Subscribe. Join the, join the club. It's going to be a really fun season. Really excited to get to share it with you guys. All right, so some more good things that we saw from UK. I mentioned the offense. I mentioned the pacing. I mentioned the guard play. I'm going to pause here one more time for water. I mentioned the shot selection. And we'll get to the shot selection as a whole. Kentucky took a lot of threes in this game. And I want to, instead of starting this as a negative point, I want to talk about this in a positive light. From a numbers standpoint, from a very basic numbers standpoint, Kentucky took 29 threes, and they made nine of them. That's 31% from beyond the arc. That's a bit of a lower clip than you would like, but to be able to take 29 threes in a game in your season opener where you didn't necessarily have to do a lot to run away from this New Mexico State team. You could have been comfortable in the paint. You scored 46 points there. You ended up shooting over 50 or almost 60% in the second half in this one. You could have gotten out and ran and gotten to the rim just about whenever you wanted to. You could have drawn a lot of fouls if you had desired. Kentucky only had 19 free throw attempts in this game after having 12 in the first half. You could have done different things, but Kentucky and John Welch and John Calipari chose to take 29 threes, to take as many threes, to let their personnel dictate their offense and the strengths, therefore, of it. That, my friends, should be something that we pay attention to. Let's get, let's get like, like, like I said at the beginning, beginning of the show, let's get more data. Let's get more samples here. Let's figure out what's actually going on. Because if we get 10 games into the season and Kentucky is averaging over seven or eight made threes a game, that's a significant improvement Um, If you're averaging eight threes a game compared to where you just were a season ago, if you can get this thing up and you can also get your shooting percentages up a little bit, it's going to be, I think, uh, it's going to prove what we were worried about in the offseason, what we were thinking about as to whether or not this team can actually take the next step and become more of a modern style offense that has more efficient shot selection. I don't remember a ton of mid-range jumpers from this contest. I think there were more taken in the first half than there were in the second. Same thing with the exhibition game, just trying to get these kids to take better shots. But the three-point shooting is something I think we're going to have to monitor. I think that's a good thing, though. Kentucky taking more threes is a good thing. Also, the three-point defense, I think, was better in this game. New Mexico State ended up only shooting 21% in this game. They shot 10% in the second half. Kentucky really clamped down. I was impressed by that. I was impressed by the rotations. Even whenever things got kind of helter-skelter and things got out of sorts, Kentucky was still able to collect themselves. Will they be able to better do that against a better opponent? I'm not sure. Let's continue to also monitor that, both sides of the arc, both offensively and defensively. How does Kentucky approach the game? That's something that we need to monitor, but I thought both overall both were good things uh, overall in this game. Now I want to get to the negatives. I've only got three here. Trey Mitchell didn't shoot as well as he has. I don't really have a whole lot else to say about this. Trey Mitchell was shooting phenomenally during the Global Jam in the two exhibition games. He only shot three of eight in this one, 0 of three from downtown. 3 of 4 from the foul line. He had 9 rebounds, 5 assists, so it's in a steal. So it's uh, statistically only one personal foul, by the way. 
statistically, he played well outside of shooting the basketball. Uh, if he's able to go uh, over these next few games and he's able to kind of get that percentage back up, that'll be nice. But that's also something to pay attention to. Uh, does he come out the gate flat? Because that's something that we didn't predict, but we were pondering here on Locked On Kentucky as to whether or not that may happen if people are picking up on the scouting report on Trey Mitchell. Um, and and he, while he is a plug-and-play piece, how how does he perform um, is a question, especially against Kansas. So Trey Mitchell didn't shoot as well, also played very well outside of that. The second thing I want to get to here as far as the bad things, um, the shot selection at times was rushed in this game. Even the outside shots, okay, I'm okay with you taking 29 threes. It just felt like there was a, there was a lot that could have been done just a little bit better. And I'm not going to sit here and nitpick it, too, nitpick it too hard and give you like specific examples because I believe that this team will settle in. It's the first game of the season. It's all right. You won by 40 and you scored 86 points in the process. Shout out Jordan, Jordan Burks for making that last second three there at the end. This is okay. It's fine. It's whatever. But it's something to pay attention to. It was something that, that was not great in this game. Will it improve? Probably. Let's keep an eye on it. And then the final, the final thing. Wagner's threes is specifically, I thought could have been better. I, I think that the shot selection from DJ Wagner from outside the arc could have been a little bit better. He had some open ones that he just straight up missed. Um, he had a couple of that it, that he took that felt a little rushed. I'm not saying I don't want to shoot. I don't want to see DJ Wagner shooting. I'm just saying a, a little bit of a different approach there um, may help because if he ends up going one one of five or two of five consistently night in and night out, the ball needs to go somewhere else. And I'm not saying that we need to make that decision one game in. I'm saying that you make that decision eight to ten games in, and uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, but Wagner's trying to become a better three-point shooter. I believe he's got it in him. I think that he, again, plays extremely hard, and he should be rewarded for that, therefore, on the offensive end of the floor. So let's just also pay attention to this. I think it's okay. The way that it panned out, it's fine. You're also probably not going to see him shoot as poorly consistently. But if he does... It's something we need to pay attention to. So those are the good things. Those are the bad things. I want to know what you guys thought about this game in the YouTube comments below. And then I want to kind of just kind of refresh, look ahead. Where's Kentucky going after this first game? I think everything's right now. It's going to be okay. I'm eager with that Kansas uh, matchup here in just a week or so. Before I dive into all of that, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available, and that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. You can add your job to the purple hashtag hiring frame on your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. I've got really simple tools like screening questions to make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can prioritize who you would like to interview and hire Quickly, small businesses love LinkedIn Jobs. They rate them number one in delivering quality hires against leading competitors. And LinkedIn Jobs, pretty simple, helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to, but faster. You can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That is linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Oh, wrapping up the uh, the Monday edition of Locked On Kentucky. Lance Dahl hanging out here with you. I am really thirsty for some reason tonight. I guess it's just been the case here as of late uh, with these episodes where I've just kind of gotten on a roll and I get really excited about it and I just end up needing to pause for a moment, take a sip of water. Let's try and wind things down here. Looking ahead, what are the Wildcats as they begin this season? Well, for those of you who are just now joining uh, to begin the season, first of all, welcome. Subscribe if you're new, whether you're on podcast or on YouTube. Second of all, we, we've talked about this for the majority of the offseason while these players have been out, but what Kentucky is right now is they're shorthanded. Uh, they just simply do not have the personnel that they expected to just a few weeks ago. Um, with the Zvonimir Ivasic possibly being uh, able to go, and uh, Aaron Bradshaw and Uganda Nienzo now kind of, you know, being having been reassessed uh, about a month or so ago. And it's like, well, okay, we're actually going to get them four or five weeks into the season. Aaron Bradshaw may, maybe, I'm leaning towards no, may be ready for that Kansas game. Just going to have to wait and see. Don't know what's going to happen with the three of them, period. But the, the, the fact still stands. Kentucky is shorthanded. And until they get those players back, 
This is not a complete team. This is a short-term problem for Kentucky, knock on wood, and you are going to see the product, I think, improve once you get these guys out on the court. And I'm not sitting here telling you that Trey Mitchell's a bad player. I'm just saying that a team will function significantly better whenever they have all of the players that they expect to have in their lineup and in their rotation, healthy and able to play. Kentucky, with three seven-footers, is going to look and play, I think, just a little bit differently. I think the pacing is going to be similar, but I think stylistically what they want to do around the rim is going to change. First of all, I think the... um, how do I describe this? The the two exhibition games and then this game against New Mexico State, against the Aggies, you saw so much like scrappy fighting, diving for rebounds, just kind of awkward. You don't have Oscar Sheebway there in the middle anymore to kind of take things over. But to be fair, you also don't have three seven-footers that you needed to start the season. You will have better rebounding and you will have better possessions once these guys get in the game. Once you go, and once Bradshaw, and once Big Z are out there at different points, you're going to see Kentucky take advantage of their height and be more physical and be more aggressive. It is simple as that. I think you're going to see more blocks, although that is not a true representation of how good you defend the rim. I think you are going to see better rebounding. I think you are going to see more second chance points. Kentucky is going to be able to get theirs, and that's actually an interesting question. Kentucky only had, uh, I said only have, uh, I say only had, uh, 11 offensive rebounds in this one. They outboarded the uh, the Aggies by 10, so a plus 10 rebounding margin there. I think Kentucky can potentially be even more dominant on that side uh, if, they can, if they are able to get the height in uh, that they have waiting to uh, get healthy and approved. The second thing I want to say here about, and this ties into the rotation, about looking ahead. Does Kentucky do what they did again against a better opponent that they did tonight? And they, if you did not watch this game, at various points, for what felt like an extended period of time, Kentucky went with a lineup that consisted of DJ Wagner, Rob Dillingham, Reed Shepard, Adu Thiero, and not Trey Mitchell at the five, Jordan Burks. They went uber small with three guards that could play point in their lineup. Those were things that we dreamt of a season ago with Kentucky trying to do with their personnel, especially when they were injured. And now all of a sudden we see game one. We see Kentucky jump on this because they have the four deep backcourt that they were excited about to begin the year. I think Kentucky is going to do this against lesser opponents against teams that do not have the talent that Kentucky does, against teams that do not have the size that maybe some more difficult opponents will. Um, But whether or not they do that against a team like Kansas or North Carolina uh, is a really interesting question. And actually, speaking of, I need to go check and see what on earth happened to the North Carolina Tar Heels because last time I checked, okay, so they did end up beating Radford by by 16. That was a game uh, at halftime. That's a team Kentucky can beat. That's a team Kentucky can lose to, by the way. But nonetheless, it is a better opponent, I think, than they face tonight. What did Kentucky do with their rotation overall? That's kind of what I'm curious about looking ahead with this team. You're going to see, I think, some more things tried. You're going to see some different types of shots thrown up by the Wildcats. I think the defense was really solid tonight. I I, I really did enjoy the defense that Kentucky had uh, at moments in this game. Uh, It was a little bit shaky uh, at the beginning, but... You were able to clamp down, get things done. Kentucky play hard. They did not shoot statistically the best, but I think you will absolutely take a performance like this to begin the season with such a such a young, uh, short-handed team. So if you've got any thoughts on the win, you can leave it in the YouTube comments below. I'm really excited to start this season with you guys. It's going to be so much fun. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at LockedOnUK. You can follow me on Twitter at LanceDaw underscore, and you can follow the show over on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, you can leave that in the YouTube comments below. You can hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless.